Now, there are people experiencing common grace right now across this world, and they are existing in Him to some degree, and the goodness that they're experiencing is from Him. So they're partaking in it to some degree, so they exist to some degree. But those of us who are connected to the vine, we derive our nutrients from the vine, from Him, from the Word of God. We bear fruit. We exist in Him. We, we become part of Him. We're grafted into Him. I know that kind of sounds weird. Not, we're not, you're not going to become Jesus, okay? Don't, don't take my words wrong. But that wording is important. You're grafted into Him. Like literally your strength derives from Him, your life, your everything. You don't exist without Him, and neither does anyone else. You want to truly experience life? Right here. All right, well, we are in an, our Exodus series, uh, deep into the series, actually going to be in part five. And um, the title of today's message is The Name. So last week we really looked at Moses and his encountering of the mountain. The mountain here where he's going to encounter Yahweh, the name. We're going to be introduced to who God is. Last week we were really introduced to who Moses is. We've already tracked his life from the Nile till now. We've seen his upbringing, 40 years in Egypt, and now he's 40 years in the desert. And at the end of that 40 years in the desert, he's 80 years old. He is now going to approach the mountain and liberate God's people from Egypt. So last week we looked at this great task that he's been given and the pushback from Moses. Now, we can all act like we wouldn't have pushed back. But you're called to liberate the world's largest standing power to this day, Egypt, in power longer than any nation. Moses is called to confront that nation and liberate God's people. Tell me you wouldn't push back a little bit. And so what we see last week is Moses time and time again saying, but I don't know who your name is, so not going to be able to go, sorry. So he's like, well, let me tell you who I am. He's like, okay, well, you know, well, if I show up and I tell them, what if they don't believe me? Well, I'm going to give you some signs. Throw your staff on the ground. Put your hand in your cloak. Take water from the Nile and pour it on the ground and see what happens. He gives them these, these miracles, these signs, and it, it, I assume it helps Moses, but in the end it doesn't seem like it does because the last conversation that Moses has is this. After all of his excuses... All of his excuses is this, I just don't want to go. Send someone else, please, anybody else but me. And I love this because that's the call of God. You're called to do something that is bigger than you. And if you don't look at that task and say, I can't do this, you ain't called to it. Because if you think you can do it, oh, you can do it in your strength and you can give it a shot. But if it's an eternal work, it can only be done by his eternal power worked out through Christ Jesus in you. The only way that we accomplish these things. We talked about the person who's chomping at the bit, like, put me in, coach. And then they get in there and they're like, man, this is hard. Put, take me out, coach. <laughs> But then there's the guy in the back who's like, yeah, I don't know about this. Man, that looks like that's impossible. But he surrenders to the call of God. He surrenders at every step of the process. And it's not easy. As the flesh is confronted, he surrenders. And that's what we have in Moses here. He is confronting the God of creation. And so here we have the name. Last week we kind of looked at Moses. Now we look at the name. Who is he? Who is the one that Moses is approaching? I ended last week by talking about God calling dangerous men. And that meekness, the definition of meekness is, is strength um, concealed. It is a man who can wield a sword but can keep it sheathed. Early in Moses' life, he couldn't keep it sheathed. He pulled it out and he killed a man. But that's still Moses. He's still a man of action. He's still a man of movement. When I was saying that, guess who was uh, in India, in hostile areas, preaching the gospel? Josh West. 
That's dangerous. Yeah. Going up into northern India where they're hostile to the gospel. And he, he sent me a message before, and he says, I'm about, about to preach to a sea of, I think it was 10,000 people, 5,000, I don't know, it's a lot of stinking people. And he, and he had to tell them to leave their idols and to serve the one and only true God. That's dangerous. Yeah. God has called us to impossibility. But what we do is we, we put one foot in front of the other, and Josh put one foot in front of the other, and, he's, and now he's on his way home, but had the opportunity to stand and preach the gospel. I love that, that, that it was confirmed after the message was preached, and I'm talking to him, and I'm like, well, there we go. There we go. God's calling people like him still, and some of them are in this room. You see, this is what we're talking about, this approaching of the name. And if it doesn't humble you, then you ain't approaching him. If the call doesn't scare you to death, it's not his call. It's one of your own making. It's real easy. It makes sense. <laughs> Our plans always make perfect sense. His plans sometimes, most of the time, scare you to death. So let's look at the approach. As Moses, last week, we find ourselves on the mountain. Who is he approaching? Let's look at Exodus chapter 3. We're going to reread this, um, revisit this passage, and then we're going to visit some new passages within this text that we didn't look at last week. But Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness... To, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. Underline angel of the Lord. Out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sign. Why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside... To see God called to him out of the bush. So we have an angel in the bush. Now we have God in the bush. Hmm, interesting. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said to him, here I am. So what we're introduced to here is, and I didn't give you this scripture, sorry for that. What we're introduced to here is a theophany. A, a presentation of God on earth. Is God the bush? No. The bush is not consumed. Is God the angel? Yes and no. <laughs> yeah. Here we see immediately what, what Judaism in the ancient world called the, the dual powers concept. It was later considered heresy after Christianity was established because of obvious reasons, because Christianity has a similar claim. That God is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In, in ancient times, they, they had the teaching of the two powers. And here we have God in the bush and the angel of Yahweh in the bush. What is it? Is it God or is it an angel? Well, yes and yes. <laughs> We're talking about God here. Now, what you're going to find is when we see these theophanies, you're never just looking at God perfectly. You're never like looking at him and, and defining him perfectly. You, you see his feet. You see his backside. You see these images that the Bible gives you, things like a bush that seem to be like a veil of sorts that are shielding. He doesn't just show up and look you straight in the eye and burn you up. There seems to be a buffer of sorts that's happening in these moments. We're going to look at some of these theophanies in the Old Testament and how the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh. How the angel of Yahweh, in my opinion, is the pre-incarnate Christ. In Jude's opinion, is the pre-incarnate Christ that liberated the children of Israel and led them out into the desert and into the promised land. And this angel, if you read, was given the power to forgive sins. Hmm. Wow. What claims did Jesus make? Yeah. It's a deep, 
deep dive into who God is and how he presents himself to humanity. So we have this this theophany that's represented. We're going to see him represented in multiple ways. But my question is this. If you could encapsulate him, if you could draw a picture of him and surmise him in a paragraph, would he be God or would you? See, we were given the task of naming animals, not him. Yeah. We were given the task of subduing the earth. Not him. He names you. You don't name him. He defines himself. Now we can see the arrogance that we would come to him with all of our presupposed ideas. Like, okay, now here's my list. Here I am. This is who I am. This is what my mommy told me. This is what my daddy told me. This is how they treated me. This is how I felt. He's like, that's all great, man, and I sympathize with you, and I love you, and I came to die for you so that I could know the struggle that you're going through. I get all that. But, but, yeah, it's all Jesus. It's all him. He is the one we are approaching. He is the angel in the bush. He is God. We don't come to him with our ideas. We come to him with our shoes off and our face in the mud. Because he is God and we are not. He defines himself. We have this theophany. Let's look at this theophany in um, in Joshua chapter 5 verse 15. First of all, I want you to show you they're leaving the desert and they're going into the promised land. We're fast forwarding in time here, if you will. And Joshua is going into the Holy Land and he confronts a man who is there around the Jericho area. And he asks the guy, are you for us or against us? And the angel's like, neither. I'm the angel of the army of the Lord. I am Jehovah Sabaoth, the commander of the entire army of heaven. Now take your shoes off. Because the ground you're standing on is holy. Whew, let's read that. Joshua chapter 5 verse 15. And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals for, from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. We have the understanding here that that Joshua is worshiping this angel. What you're going to see later in the book of Revelations and in other passages is when true malak or messengers are worshipped, they tell you to stop doing it. If you bow to an actual angel, they say, get up, I'm not to be worshipped. Unless it's a fallen angel, they will accept your worship. That is the the role of a biblical angel is to say, no, you don't worship me. But what we see, angel of the Lord receives worship, receives sacrifice, tells you to take your shoes off because the ground's holy. This ain't no normal angel. This is God himself on earth communicating with us. We see this commander of the army of the Lord. He meets them there. And what you're going to find time and time again is when these men of God confront these angels, once they realize who they are, it scares them to death. You're going to see that in this next passage. Um, We're going to look at a, a man named Gideon. In Judges chapter 6, verse 22, Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, the Malach of Yahweh. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God. Oh, he said what? Alas, O Lord God. He understands what this angel is. For now I have seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, do not fear. You shall not die. You get it? Like, death is an option. Death is an option, Gideon. Your disrespect. So what you're not going to see, what I don't have time to get into, I have a whole separate message I do on Gideon, the pillar. But what we're going to find before this is that he's been going back and forth once again like Moses with this angel. It's not in a bush this time. But the angel's going back and forth, giving him signs and, and, and re-encouraging him and, and back and forth. And, and Gideon just keeps pushing back the whole time too. It's a common mark of a man of God who's called to something great. 
just keeps pushing back and pushing back and pushing back. And finally, the angel's like, he reveals who he is because he consumes a sacrifice on a rock. We see that he touches a stone after Gideon brings the sacrifice to this angel, to this man, or, or this food to this angel to eat. The angel receives it as a sacrifice, touches the, the stone, fire comes out of the stone, consumes the sacrifice, and Gideon's like, oh, snap. I done messed up. I've been arguing with God. That's what it says. Alas, O Lord God, I have seen the angel of God face to face. But the Lord said, it's it's going to be calm down. I'm not going to kill you because killing you is an option. (laughs) But I'm not going to. He, He has mercy on him. So here we have the angel of Yahweh, the commander of the army of the Lord. We're going to look at one more in Genesis. So we look at, we've, we've, I've made reference to, to this a few times, and I'm sorry if you guys weren't familiar with the story, but here we go. Um, Jacob um, wrestles an angel, and he overcomes the angel. He says that he sees this angel and, and that this is, once again, God. Later on in life, you can see Jacob's writings, and what Jacob says is that he, he, the angel, the, the God that he wrestled in the desert, he remembers that moment. He knows what was happening in that desert as he's wrestling this angel, if you will. Let's read that passage. Genesis chapter 32, verse 30, uh, 28 through 30. No longer will your name be Jacob. The man told him, the man told him, But Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, please tell me your name. Why do you ask my name? Hmm. The man replied, then he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob named the place Penel, explaining, certainly I have seen God face to face and have survived. You think Jacob understood what he was encountering, the divine? There's a theophany in these three occasions, and then the fourth being the burning bush. We see that God is represented in these passages, and we can even see the duality to the Father and the Son in the bush. Jesus, the angel of Yahweh in the bush, and God speaking from the bush. You can even see this when talking with Gideon. You'll see that the angel leaves and that God is still there speaking. It's interesting when you break down these theophanies and you can tell there's two things happening here. There's two, seem to be two, uh, like Judaism would say, two powers represented in those moments. Is God two? No, he is one. God is one. Let's make that clear. He represents himself in, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so... We move on. So he wrestles an angel and he overcomes. Like, did he win? (laughs) No. But God allowed the wrestling to take place. And we've referenced this many times that, that Israel means those who wrestle with God. That's where it comes from. That is our lot in this life. Wrestling with him, wrestling with his identity, wrestling with his truth. Coming up against him and us changing, not changing him in the process. So we have Jacob wrestling this angel. Next, let's keep moving you read the book of Hebrews as well. Hebrews gives a, a, tells us not to worship angels and explains that Jesus is greater than the angels. He was made to be a little lower than the angels for a time. He, what does that mean? He means he becomes humanity. And in the hierarchy of things, it is, it is humanity. It is, it is these Elohim or angels, if you will, and then God. There is this... Hierarchy. He becomes lower than the angels and comes to the lowest point to us to save us. And then he ascends to God and gives gifts to men. So he is not lower than the angels, but he makes himself lower than the angels. For he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And he learned obedience through the things he suffered. He, he, he steps down to our level, and this is the beauty of our faith. 
So I want to think about this for a minute. This, this bush is unconsumed. So everything in, in life that is, 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 is combustible is consumed. Anything of value, diamonds, gold, silver, it can be consumed at high heats. It's really interesting when you look back even beyond the Big Bang and the, that occurrence in the solar systems, what you find is a, a hot heat that is translucent that you can't even see now in, in time because it's translucent. We can't view it. In, we can view the, the light emanating from the Big Bang and the creation of this world, but we can't view beyond it. All we can see is this translucent power beyond there's a great conversation right now about this among astrophysicists. I am not one. So let me leave this conversation quickly and get on to something that I'm better at. But this is unconsumed. I want you to think about that for a minute. He is unconsumable. Even gold melts down. All things melt down. He is unconsumable. He's unburned up. This bush is not consumed. Now in the desert, bush, bushes did naturally combust. But this one isn't consumed. And that's why Moses is looking, saying, why isn't this consumed? And he uh, attends to the bush. And that's where he has his encounter with God, speaking to him in this unconsumable fire. What in your life is consumable? Seriously. Seriously. What in your life is not a part of him? What is consumable? His goal is to remove it from your life. Scripture by scripture, conviction by conviction, confession by confession. To walk you through that. To bring order to our chaos. Let's look at fearing God and the scripture that goes along with that. Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse 5 and 6. Then he said, do not come near. This is God talking from the bush. Remember? His voice is coming from the bush. Take your sandals off your feet. Sound familiar? We just read that from the commander of the army of God. Now it's God saying it. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And in his encounter of God, he's afraid to look at him. How is your encounter of God going? Are you approaching him like that? Or are you high stepping into his throne room, announcing who you are, who you're going to be, and what you're going to do? That's no stance to the father of it all. And he stops Moses in his tracks to let him know who he is. Now, what he's going to let him know first is that this is a continuation, once again, of Genesis. He's the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's letting him know, that's me. I'm not these other supposed gods, these fallen entities, these demons, if you will, that are being worshipped in Egypt. That ain't me. The God of bondage that they're serving, that ain't me. I am the God of Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac, and Abraham. So we're, he's going to announce who he is. He's not just some random God among many, which is what they thought in Egypt. Did you know that monotheism is, is one of the most radical ideas ever to hit humanity? Radical monotheism. Because before this, God is in creation. But what, we, what we're introduced to here is a God that's outside of all of it. We're not, we're not seeking Poseidon for, for sea travels. We're not seeking Aphrodite for a better sex life. Like we're not looking into creation. We're not in Romans 1, serving the creature. Like he, what, what, what happens here is, is, is radical. You've got to understand that. Monotheism is almost atheism. It is. We all agree on a source to it all. Polytheism, polytheism is the belief in multiple gods. They believe there's a God for everything. And when Christianity comes around, they almost... Taught of us like we were atheists. 
Because they believe in hundreds of gods. They're like, what do you mean? You just believe in a first cause? Like, what do you mean? Now, I'm not saying atheism and Christianity is the same thing. Don't get me wrong. But that's the reality. We're all saying there's a first cause, whether it's chaos or it's divine order. And what we're finding is we look back into time and we postulate the galaxies. It's like a pyramid. It's expanding. But it expanded from one point. Let there be. And we have a reverse pyramid now. We have a God that comes to us. A God that speaks. That we're still looking at the light of Him speaking in our solar system. (laughs) And we are without excuse, my friend. Because He speaks. He sends His word and He heals them. He speaks, let there be. He speaks order to our lives. And what we find is that it it goes to a single originating point. What we find is order. What we're finding now is that it's, guess what? Spinning into chaos as the universes expand. Oh, and it's vast. And we only see a tiny little corner of it. We're talking billions of galaxies and stars in those galaxies. Like, it, it, we are, yeah, but he who knew no sin became sin. That's where it should blow your stinking mind, man. Because you can reverse back to his glory and his power. And he did not consider a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation to come down here with us on this dirt rock. He speaks order to the solar system. He speaks order to your lives. He speaks from the bush. It is not consumed And he says, take off your shoes. This is pretty interesting. It's a return to the garden. You know what they do when they leave the garden? They put on skins. Thank you. They put on skins. He puts on animal skins when they leave the garden. When when he comes back into his presence, takes off the skins. Pretty cool, right? The imagery in the Old Testament, is beautiful. It's beautiful to see these, these, this imagery and what's happening here. The veil is a sort of that in the temple. Once again, this divine portal, if you will, that connects us to the God of creation and this unconsumed fire, this holy ground, this untainted ground that is not affected by the land of the damned and anti-Eden. Because this ground ain't earth. This ground, yeah, it's where God is. <laughs> take your stinking shoes off. Oh, and Moses takes his stinking shoes off. I love it. Let's keep going here for time's sake as we end with the name. Let's read that. As we hear him define who he is... Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is the name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Boy. And he said, Say to this people of Israel, I have sent... I am... I am has sent me to you. Excuse me. God also said to Moses, say to this people of God, um, sorry, say to this, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Abraham, Abraham has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So we're looking at the name, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. And here we have him announcing who he is. What I love about this, and I've taught this before, so I won't go too 
much into this point, but you know, we, 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 we function off of a clock. Everything is clock based. You know, it's, the clock's ticking. Like we get up in the morning, we eat breakfast, we go to work, we do what we do. We understand this construct of time um, in our own way. But what we're going to find here is that, 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 that He is I am. And when He announces that He is I am, what He is saying is He self-exists. Chew on that for a minute. You don't really exist. Now, that may sound weird. I'm not saying this is the matrix. <laughs> Apart from Him, you don't exist. He is the only thing that self-exists. So we don't really exist in, 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 if, if we don't exist in Him. Now, there are people experiencing common grace right now across this world, and they are existing in Him to some degree, and the goodness that they're experience, experiencing is from Him. So they're partaking in it to some degree, so they exist to some degree. But those of us who are connected to the vine, we derive our nutrients from the vine, from Him, from the Word of God. We bear fruit. We exist in Him. We, we become part of Him. We're grafted into Him. I know that kind of sounds weird. Not, we're not, you're not going to become Jesus, okay? Don't, don't take my words wrong. But that wording is important. You're grafted into Him. Like literally your strength derives from Him. Your life, your everything. You don't exist without Him. And neither does anyone else. You want to truly experience life? Right here. You want to experience beauty? You want to experience life dialed into its most beautiful perfection? And in your mind you're thinking, yeah, man, that's like a mansion. I got a car. I got an infinity pool. I'm like chilling on the patio. The best life he might have for you might be getting your head cut off in a coliseum. Oh, well, let's rethink that life. That's a different life. <laughs> I was, but if it's his life for you, then it's for his glory. Yeah. Chop away. Let's go. But do you get what I'm saying? He is the only one who self exists. I am. You know what Yahweh means? Literally, the definition of Yahweh is. That's it. To be, yeah, but really distilled down to its purest form, is. He is. And you are not, <laughs> unless you are in Him. Nobody? No, just me. Glory. I'll receive it today. <laughs> the name. He self-exists. You do not exist in Him, my friend, and experience the best marriage you've ever experienced. Experience a fatherhood you never thought you could know. Experience a provision and a joy and a peace and a connection to your Creator that grounds you to your original purpose in all of this. So we have Him announcing who He is. Tell them I am sent you. Like, that's gangster. I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't talk about God like that. Forgive me. But you know what I'm saying, hopefully. Like, if you come to me, like, and you're like, you know, you're new in the program, and you come up to me, and you're like, yeah, that's a great message. Say, what's your name? I am. And you're like, no, 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 what's your name? Like, is. What's wrong with this guy? He just is? <laughs> right? Like, that's gangster. Like, you got to, like, excuse me? You just are? Yes, I just am. You can't name me. <sighs> okay. I hear you now. <laughs> you just are. And all these names that we're given to things are, yeah, kind of pretend. Because you've given us the opportunity to do so. Oh, God, help us. Let me, let me move. Let me move. Yahweh is I am to be. He is. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. We function off of the time clock. He takes the time clock off the wall and he crushes it. He's at the beginning still. Or we can travel back in time and it would take hundreds and hundreds of years in space travel back to the moment of that. But you, you, 
but he is beyond all of it. He is the first cause. He is Alpha Omega beginning in. He's at the beginning still and he's already at the end. He's beyond creation. This radical monotheism, he self exists on his own without anyone or anything. So we are identified in him. Let me get to our last scripture here. This is why this is going to be so important. Because what Moses experiences on the mountain is the first cause. The, the, the point of origin of, of order, of everything, of the cosmos. Not some pretend God from Egypt. He has encountered God on the mountain. God is defining who he is and empowering him to go out to move. Now I want you to think about the scripture that should open your eyes now to what Jesus was claiming. Listen to him talk. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died as you as did the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Hmm, I think we know who he's making himself out to be. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. Ooh, he just told you who his dad is. And you claim he's yours. But you have not known him. (laughs) I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. (laughs) I love Jesus. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said So the Jews said to him, "You are not 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham?" Jesus said to him, "Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was Ego I me, I am. What's Jesus saying here? We know the story. We know the mountaintop experience. Verse 59, they knew what he was saying too. So they picked up stones to throw at him. They wanted to kill him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. (laughs) So... Jesus says, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's literally pronouncing what Yahweh pronounced from the mountain. That's blasphemy. Unless he is who he says he is. And my friend, he is who he says he is. They pick up stones to kill him. You know why? Because he claims to be the God in the bush. Like the God that empowered Moses to move water. (laughs) The God that empowered Moses to liberate an entire nation from the largest world power of history. That God, you claim to be him. You claim to be the first cause before all of it. I am sent you. And I am is here. So they pick up like, oh, no, he didn't. And they start just, I, you know, they were just all just pissed. Just looking for stones. Like, give me just more stones. There's rocks. <laughs> just kill this guy. Just wanted, just pick it up. Just wanted to kill him. You know why? Because he's claiming to be God on the mountain. But God reverse engineers the pyramid. And he comes to us 
in our brokenness. He speaks order. We, we devolve into chaos. And He speaks order and He corrects course. He brings life and light to our life. And when we abide in the vine, when we are in Him, when we exist in Him, we truly exist. Because we exist in the only one who exists. The only one who self-exists. Yahweh is. What's your name? Is. What's your name? I am beyond time. Let me end with this. We got this crazy concept of time, and really it's a construct that we created to some degree um, according to the solar systems and how we map things and how we judge time. But it's interesting, but check this out. That if, if you set, if, if, if two people on the day of your birth set your clocks to exactly the same time and you had a perfect watch that did not change, and you lived completely separate lives, at the end of your lives, your clocks would say something different because you experience time differently. Because you traveled at different elevations. You traveled against the rotation of the earth or with it. Now, it's only incremental changes. We're not talking days here. We're talking seconds. But that's humanity, like in this construct of time, like pushing against it, like looking at time even in the solar system and past time and the burning out of stars and, and postulating galaxies. Like we're, we're, we're looking into these things. Mm. So at the end of life, we've pushed back against time a little bit. Seconds. Seconds. Oh, you can push, and you can travel, you can climb every mountain, you can traverse every ocean, you can plumb its depths, you can travel through the solar system. Oh, but you're just going to push against it a little bit. Oh, and if you do some space travel, you can really push against time. You can come back to Earth and have, having aged much longer than those who were, or much less, right, than those who were here. I'm not an astrophysicist, you can tell. Anyway. You get the point. We're pushing against time and can make these tiny little incremental changes. He's beyond it. The alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He's at the beginning and he's already at the end, my friend. He is Jesus and Jesus announces who he is. My friend, he is our God. He is the God on the mountain. He is the God that came down to the mountain. He is the God that beckoned to Moses to come to the mountain. He is the God that came to Gideon. He is the God that came to Joshua. He is the God that comes to us in our brokenness and in our filth. Let's bow our heads. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the beauty in this creation. We thank you that you form order. And God, you form order in our lives. Lord, forgive us for, for clinging to our own identity. For, forgive us for clinging to who we think we are. God, help us to come to you um, emptied of ourselves, accepting your plan and your prescription for our lives. God, we surrender to you. We love you and we thank you. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said...